Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about energy in a zero carbon world. I guess a few of you, almost all of you will have read yesterday uh, with disappointment, uh, the analysis of the latest IPCC report, which says that we're just not doing very well against carbon uh, challenges. I think everybody in this room is a bought into the idea of uh, working against climate change by decarbonizing the power sector, decarbonizing uh, Western economies. But the truth is we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time today talking about OVO Energy. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we see that need to be solved, not just in the UK, but across the energy sector uh, and the economy generally, if we're going to move to a zero carbon world. There's a lot of work to be done. And the number one takeaway that we've arrived at is that it's not something that companies can solve on their own. And I don't mean that any one company can solve on their own, but I think we need to change the way we look at the energy model to say we need to start looking more at collaborating instead of uh, all of us focusing on our own businesses. So this is Deptford Power Station. Uh, it opened in 1891. It was the world's first centralized high voltage power station in the, uh, in the world. Uh, 1,000 horsepower, ladies and gentlemen. That was, that's, that's how they reported it at the time. About five miles away, and it ran on a seven-mile cable to a substation just outside Grosvenor Square. Uh, and ever since then, the model for energy has been basically the same. You build a large power station, you have a very long wire, and then you have customers at the end of it. So, we set out in 2009 uh, to deliver energy that was cheaper, greener, and simpler for UK customers. It was very straightforward. We were very retail focused. Uh, we bought energy from the wholesale market, and we sold it to residential customers, and we did our best to make that as simple as possible. And we're still trying to do this today, but to keep making progress in this, we have had to go not just further into uh, the retail sector, but also go the other side, try to figure out where the energy is coming from, and also behind the meter to figure out where the energy is going. And we've heard a lot of this today from various different uh, companies, from Bulb, from Verve, trying to understand where the energy is going and how we best harness it. So I talked a little bit about the IPCC report. The good news for the UK is that we're doing pretty well. Relative to the rest of the world, we are doing pretty well. In fact, last year, uh, we reduced our carbon emissions by 42% below the 1990 level. And to put that into context, what that actually means, this is a chart showing total UK carbon emissions, not per capita, but total emissions, going back to about 1860. So we are now below the level we were at at 1891 when the first coal-fired power station went live, which is great news. The, the bad news is that most of the uh, easy part of this challenge has been solved. Uh, it's actually not that difficult to integrate renewables, wind and solar, mm -hmm. Uh, especially onto the grid, when you get to about 20, 25%. Up to that point, you can integrate renewables onto the grid relatively easily. After that, that's when the fun starts. So to understand what we mean by that, we're going to have to start. Uh, it's a bit of a science lesson, I'm afraid. So you'll have to bear with me as I try to keep up the time with the video, which I've understood today. I cannot pause. So <laughs> this is a representation of the UK. You can see large power stations there and lots of small connections. They're power stations and customers. This is a representation of a power grid that you can find all over the world. So large power station, a transmission and distribution grid, and customers at the end of the wire. And for about 130 years, this has been the model, and it's the same all over the world. We change the level of output in the power stations to react to changes in demand. So that's a very important point. We change the level of supply to meet demand. Now, as I said earlier, we've reached about 25 to 30 percent renewable capacity in the UK. Some days are more, some days are less. Um, but in terms of the averages, we're at about 30 percent. What happens next uh, involves understanding how the grid works. And everybody here should know uh, that we use alternating current. Uh, we talked about frequency a little bit earlier. Um, and and uh, as we, we learned, each device draws power at a different frequency, but on average, the UK grid operates somewhere between 49.5 and 50.5 hertz. And if it gets too high, uh, too high or too low, devices start to shut off and power stations start to shut off. This is a really interesting thing. Every turbine in the UK spins at exactly the same speed, exactly synchronized to the grid. So those big spinning wheels that operate in thermal power stations are entirely synchronized to the grid. 
The challenge is that solar and wind aren't synchronized. In fact, by and large, they generate in direct current, and then they need to be synchronized to the grid. And this leads to a lot of volatility. It means that when the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, we need to alter the level of power that's coming from thermal plants, not nuclear, because we can't change that output very much, but thermal plants. And these plants are not designed to be turned up and turned down very easily. So the model of changing supply to meet demand is a challenge. It's even more of a challenge as we start to electrify more and more demand. Heat and transport are by far the biggest contributors to CO2 in the UK. And if we don't tackle heat and transport, then we have no chance of meeting our carbon targets. But now we're seeing demand increase at the same time as we're seeing the volatility of the grid going up. And the demand increases, if we're not careful, because of the connected devices, because of the Internet of Things, it can be very highly correlated, meaning that all the devices theoretically could go on at the same time. Electric vehicles and electric heat uh, will add to this. As more and more people drive home in their electric cars, but a million electric cars in the road by 2022, adding about seven gigawatts of demand if everybody plugs in at exactly the same time. You add to this the complexities around distributed solar, uh, and so, this is the good thing, smart data helps with all of this, but distributed solar and batteries. And we start to end in a world where you've got gigawatts and gigawatts of demand all over the country that are being controlled and theoretically turning on and off at the same time, leading to more and more pressure on the grid. So this is the standard answer. We need a bigger grid, more wires, more copper, and then we need supply-side solutions. So grid-scale batteries and peaking plants. And if you look at what's happening in the UK market right now, National Grid is spending a fortune on peaking plants. But our solution is different. So we started off 10 years ago almost thinking about the customer uh, and what does the customer want. And the customer wants more renewable energy at the lowest possible cost when they need it. And that's really the only thing the customer cares about. So when we consider putting storage and flexibility and the kind of demand response uh, technologies that Verve were talking about, the kind of consumer behavior that Bulb were talking about earlier, we transform each home into its own cell. And we were just talking about cells, actually, so that was quite useful. Um, each home is at the center of its own energy system. And where this becomes interesting is when you start to see this amplification of uh, smart electric vehicle technology, batteries, distributed generation, applied with intelligence, and especially being able to export back out to the grid, you get this mesh effect. Now, we talked about peer-to-peer -peer trading earlier on. Um, the, the kind of model that we see working in the future is not dependent on peer-to-peer -peer transactions, but perhaps distributed connectivity. So each cell here represents a unit on the grid, and each, uh, each cell at the center of its own system balancing itself. When you have storage and flexibility behind the meter, not at grid scale or not in, in the supply side, we get this huge distributed effect. So one of the challenges that we face now is that we're going to have millions and millions of connected devices, whether that's electric vehicles, batteries, uh, tumble dryers and washing machines, you name it. If you can connect it to the internet, you can connect it to the power supply, it's going to become part of the energy grid. We're going to have millions of connected devices. And in the past 130 years, the model has been really simple. You turn up and down the energy supply to meet demand. Now energy supply is coming from renewables like solar and wind. It means that we don't get to control those. We need to control the demand to meet the supply. So it's a complete inversion of how the grid is going to work. A couple of years ago, we came across a company called VCharge. And um, the founders of eCharge had this great vision. It was a, to do with electric vehicles. And if you want to know any lesson about uh, business, is this timing is everything. They set up this business in 2007 to help integrate electric vehicles onto the grid. And there just weren't enough electric vehicles. So they pivoted to smart electric heat. And that's how we find them in the UK. There's 12 gigawatts of electric storage heat in the UK. That means if all the uh, electric storage heaters, economy seven heaters, are turned on at the same time, it would take about 15 conventional power stations to heat them. Anyway, they developed this really great technology. I mean, it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, call it what you will. It's essentially algorithmic control of distributed demand that can match real-time local signals on the grid. And this is a quick representation of what it looks like. Everybody understands this. It's a picture in the future. You have homes uh, with their own generation, their own battery storage, 
uh, electric vehicles handily plugged in here. Um, and this, this bit is clear for everybody to see. Um, and it's quite simple to think, well, we're just going to take power from peak and shift it to off-peak and so on. And there's a lot we can do with consumer behavior. But ultimately, when we look at this, it looks like the peak demand is going to go in the UK from 50 gigawatts to 90 gigawatts. The only way we're going to be able to solve this self-balancing grid where we meet uh, supply with demand is if there's algorithmic control. And now we get into conversations about security, uh, about uh, consumer preferences, about consumer engagement, about load sharing, the peer-to-peer -peer transactions, how this is all going to work. The level of complexity is enormous. And I touched briefly on security. I think it's the one thing I've been surprised not to hear anything more about today. If you imagine uh, if you were a hostile foreign power and you wanted to cause the UK economy some damage or, heaven forbid, even invade, the only thing that you would need to do is hack into about a million tumble dryers, turn them all on. That's about three gigawatts surge. That is probably enough to crash the grid. If you think about what that means for electric vehicles or all the batteries, all the other technology we're talking about, the complexity around managing interoperability, the security, and the economics of all of this system is really, really highly complex. So this is where we're going with OVO Energy. We are, today at least, uh, the largest independent energy retailer in the country, although I think tomorrow we're going to need to check again. Um, <laughs> We've got some great competition in this space. We've seen a huge explosion in innovation, in competition, uh, in customer centricity in the energy sector. Um, but one thing that I've experienced over my last 10 years at OVO Energy is that uh, where we started off thinking we are going to help the customer, we're going to help simplify uh, the energy system for the customer, what we realize now is we started off thinking about our own batteries, we started thinking about our own charging points for cars, we started thinking about our own customer interface. And what we find is it worked really well until actually we, we signed a customer that had a thermostat that we didn't install, and then we lost a customer that had a battery that we did install, and you realize the world is different. When you start thinking about the world from a customer's point of view rather than from the, uh, the grid point of view, as in the power station, distribution, then customer, when you start thinking about it from the customer first, you realize actually the customer doesn't always want to buy all their services from the same company. The customer doesn't always want to have the same brand of technology in their home. The customer wants to pick and mix and choose. And in order to make a, com a system as complex as this work, uh, it seems to us that we need to have much more collaboration across the energy sector. So I was pretty inspired by this uh, example. And we saw uh, Werner Vogels earlier on uh, talking about all things distributed. And uh, I hope he'd approve of our distributed meshed grid. I have to be honest, over the last 10 years, I have felt very protective over our energy retail business. We have fought hard to prize uh, your market share away from the big six, to compete uh, uh, against uh, inertia and apathy and government policy and regulatory frameworks that were designed for a static market. And we were very protective of our customers, and we wanted to, a lot of people say, own the customer relationship. We wanted to make sure that uh, we were in the driving seat when it came to simplifying energy for customers. I was at a dinner recently, and somebody explained to me that uh, it's this great example of where companies can compete and collaborate at the same time. So Netflix and Prime Video, Amazon Prime Video, the two biggest names in streaming entertainment. Turns out that they're both hosted on Amazon Web Services. So you've got Netflix who are competing furiously across the world for subscribers, and all their services are hosted by Amazon. And this was a big inspiration. When I look at... Google Maps on Apple phones, when I look at Kindle eBooks on uh, Android devices, when I look at the world of technology generally, we see companies focusing on the thing that they're best at and then figuring out a way to collaborate and work together to give solutions that the customer wants. So that's about it. Uh, we have a huge, exciting future ahead of us. There is uh, so much work to do. We have about 40% below 1990 levels in carbon emissions, but we have so much uh, more of the hard work in front of us than we've tackled already. The, the automation, the algorithmic control, the connection of these millions of devices, the shift away from supply side to demand side architecture, and the security considerations that we have to work through are going to require everybody's talents in this room, as well as the, the broader regulatory and political uh, landscape. 
So I think that's about it. There was one quote that I got I really liked, and, and this is a big shift for us. We are definitely in collaboration mode right now as Zoho Energy. We want to work with as many partners as possible. And this was it. There was a lot of talk about energy dinosaurs and, uh, and how business models will go out of business, and uh, sorry, business models will become uh, extinct, and how some large competitors won't change as quickly as they need to to keep up with the, the landscape. I love this quote, and it's essentially saying it's not about uh, how quickly you can change or how agile you are. In the history of mankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise have effective, uh, effectively have prevailed. So there's a, a quick observation for the energy sector. I'm flashing red now, so I must leave the stage. Thank you very much, all of you, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.